And hello, everyone. Welcome to another Gretel uh, virtual event. Today, we are doing a deep dive into Gretel Evaluate and Synthetic Quality Scoring. Um, my name is Mason Egger, and joining me today are uh, Lipica and Amy from our amazing uh, applied research teams to talk to us about synthetic quality score and all of the really cool stuff that goes behind that. So without any further ado, I'm just going to go ahead and turn it over to y'all and go ahead and present uh, when you're ready. Sounds great. So I'll bring up my screen. Yes. Bring up the thing you're going to present, because if I bring it up right now, we're going to get the infinity mirror, which is fun. OK. Um, OK. OK, so looks like we're still in infinity mirror. You ready? OK, so am I sharing? You are, but I, I see the StreamYard screen. All right, let's see if I, if I go here. OK, now, we, can, we can see the notebook. Awesome. OK, so what I'm going to do today is step everyone through our Gretel Evaluate um, Blueprint, which lets you create a synthetic quality report on any two data sets. And then we'll look, step through that report in detail and talk about how we create the SQS score and what goes into it. So in this notebook, you can see as it starts, you first, um, if you haven't already, you install your Gretel client. I've already done that, so I'm not gonna run that cell. Then you import, um, the various libraries that are needed. Pay no attention to that. And then you authenticate in the next cell. So if you if you have run um, a Gretel um, blueprint before, then your authentication will be cached. And so I've run, run, run one before, so mine is cached here. But in the event that you haven't, then what you'll need to do is go over to um, the Gretel console so here I'm on my dashboard, and you can see the API access key here. So I uh, regenerate the key and copy it, and then go back in. And here is it would prompt me for the API key if I'd never entered it before. OK, so the data set that we're going to use today is the US adult census uh, income data set that's very popular and used widely for different machine learning um, test cases. So this first cell, we grab the original training data. So this is the original data set. And you can see it's got age, work class, all these different fields that come together to predict whether your income is greater than 50K or less than or equal to 50K. OK, so now um, elsewhere, I've already created synthetic data for this data set. Um, and um, this is, was created with Gretel, but you could use it with um, any synthetic data set that you have. So here I'm going to pull up the synthetic data that I'd already created. And again, all the same fields. Looks pretty darn good. OK. And then all you got to do is click on um, Create the Report. So I'm going to go ahead and click on this. And this can take anywhere from 30 seconds up to a minute. So, so that we don't have to sit here waiting. <laughs> I already ran this notebook this morning and I have um, the report that it generates over here. So now I'm gonna step you through what report it generated. So at the very top of the screen, you can see the synthetic data quality score is 90. So that's excellent. So throughout this whole report, there's these little question marks and you can click on them and a lot of information comes up about what you're looking at. So in this little informational snippet, it tells you what the SQS uh, score means. And uh, the purpose of it is to um, test how well the uh, important statistical information in the training data was maintained in the synthetic data. So in a sense, it's like a utility or confidence score as to um, whether if you were to have done a sci scientific um, analysis in the synthetic data set, whether the conclusions you draw would have been would be the same as if you had done that scientific analysis in the training data set. So there's three scores, uh, different metrics that we use that combine together to get the SQS score. And we'll step through those in detail, but they're the field distribution stability, 
field correlation stability, and deep structure stability. So you can see here, we also tell you, depending on your use case, what we recommend for a synthetic, um, for an SQS score. So starting down here at the bottom, we say that if your use case is balance or augment machine learning data sources, or if it's machine learning or statistical analysis, then we recommend you have an excellent or a good score because the statistical integrity of data is pretty critical to that downstream use case. Um, and then further up, um, demo environments or mock data, pre-production testing environments. In those scenarios, um, you could have excellent good, but you could also have moderate. Maintaining the statistical integrity is not as critical in those use cases. And then we say, um, if you have any a score other than excellent, um, you should use uh, our tips and advice to try to improve your model more. You don't have to, but um, we give a lot of good advice for how you might do that. And if you happen to get very poor, which is rare, but if you do, then that implies that you need significant tuning up to improve your model. If I may add really quickly, Amy, um, one place that you can find tips and advice is in our documentation. Um, so there's there's a ton of info on like, like you have a small data set, if you have a wide data set, if you have primarily like numeric values in a data set, well, what you should do um, or what you can do. So um, that's that's one place to look. There are there other places like our blogs, but um, just so that's coming out of somewhere, you know where it's coming from. Uh, I wanted to provide some examples. Yeah, you're breaking up a little bit, Lipica, um, but I think I understood what you were saying. Yeah, we have a lot of documentation on how to improve your score, on what configs um, are appropriate depending on the nature of your data set. Um, lots of documentation on that. Okay, so then um, the three main scores listed here, the field correlation stability, deep structure stability, and field distribution stability. And they each have their own score, which just happens to be excellent here. Um, and they combine together to get the overall SQS score. And Lipica in a little bit will tell us about how we do that. And so you can see in this cell, we also tell you the row count in your training data um, and synthetic data, the column count in training and synthetic data, and if any training lines were duplicated in the synthetic data. So that would be very bad. You always want that to be zero. OK, so now I'm going to click on the little informational tip for field correlation stability. And what it's telling us here is that the way we compute this is we compute the correlation between every pair of fields in the training data. And then we do the same thing in the synthetic data. And then um, we take the absolute difference between these two correlation matrices. So um, we basically just subtract the two matrices, take the absolute value, and then average that. So if in to compute the correlation, if the two fields are numeric, then uh, we'll use Pearson's correlation coefficient. If one field is numeric and the other is categorical, we use correlation ratio. If both fields are categorical, then we use um, fields U. So then, um, so correlation, that's pretty critical for any kind of downstream statistical or machine learning tasks. So you, you want that number to be high. So corresponding to that, we display these heat maps so here um, is the training correlations on the left. In the middle is the synthetic correlations. And then this is the difference matrix I was talking about on the far right. So you want the first two graphs to look as much alike as possible. And the third graph to be um, as yellow, I guess that is, or light green as possible. And so um, you can use the, Plotly has a little toggle thing that I find really helpful. You click on it, um, you can see here um, that going across for this one cell, um, age and occupation, the training correlation is 0.19, synthetic correlation is 0.14, so the difference is 0.06. So that's kind of handy. All right, turn that off. 
All right, so now the second one is um, deep structure stability. So you can click on the little question mark and get a whole bunch of information about that. So we wanted another uh, metric that let us look at uh, deeper multi-field distributions and correlations. And um, PCA, it, um, we found that to do that quite effectively for us. So. Um, PCA, the way we do this is we compute um, a PCA on the training data, and then we do a PCA on the synthetic data, and then we look at the uh, principal components, and we do a distributional distance between training and synthetic, and that's the score. So PCA is um, super popular in data science. They use it for um, dimensionality reduction for visualization. So in a way, it's kind of quick feedback as to whether your synthetic data is going to be effective in a downstream machine learning task. And then, um, oh, then scroll down. We give you this super cool visualization of your PCA. The left is the training data. The right is the synthetic data. So you want this these graphs to look as much alike as possible. So here you can see there's two kind of dense clusters in the middle that are repeated in the synthetic data. So we did a pretty nice job there. Okay, then for field distribution stability, let me click on that. Okay, so this is a measure. Um, we look at the distribution, we compare the distribution in the training data of a field to the distribution in the synthetic data. And um, we use the Jensen-Shannon distance score to compute a, a distance metric. Um, so you can then go down and um, here we have the cell that gives a nice overview of all the distribution stabilities. So for every single field here in the data set, we actually did quite well. We scored an excellent score. Oh, so I forgot to mention. So excellent is... Um, up here, excellent is um, like 80 to 100, this green bar. Um, good is 60 to 80, this light green bar. Um, moderate is 40 to 60, this orange bar. And poor is 20 to 40, this dark orange bar. And then very poor is zero to 20, this red bar there. Okay, so in this training field overview, for every field, you can see how many unique values there were, um, how many missing values there were, the average length, um, and the data type it was, and how good the distribution stability is. If you end up having trouble with some fields in their distribution stability, sometimes looking at um, these um, data characteristics can be sort of insightful. So. Uh, if there's a whole bunch of missing data and the average length is really long, then it, it might be a tougher field than other fields. And then you can click on any one of these. So I'll click on age. And you can go down and see a graph for each one of the fields. So here on age, this is a histogram. And if I mouse over, you can see... So the, um, the x-axis is the actual um, value of the field, and the y-axis is the percentage of that value in the data set. So here it's saying ages between 32 and 34 uh, have or 5.81% of the data set. And if it's categorical, like here with marital status, you can, um, the purple bar is the training always, and the green bar is the synthetic always. So you can mouse over and hear um, marital status value of never married um, is 33.24% in the training and 31.86 or 66 in the synthetic. So um, that's a really nice quick snapshot with each of these graphs as to how um, how each distribution is doing. Hey, Amy, um, in the overview of each variable, those numbers there, those are for the training set, right? So the number of unique values missing average length. Yes, those are for the training. Let's awesome. see what 
little information you might get from this. Oh, just tells you what I told you. <laughs> nice. Okay. Uh, sure. I, have, I have a quick question though. Sure. Um, so can you scroll back up to the, to the top? Yeah, right there. So you said we, we were using field correlation stability, deep structure stability, and field distribution stability. How did, uh, how did you decide that those three were the ones that make a good synthetic quality data? Like I imagine there's probably other stabilities or other things. I don't know. I'm, I'm not well versed in this, but how did you decide that those three things were what was important for uh, generating quality? A ton, a ton of research and um, <laughs> explorative POCs. Uh, so th the thing is, there really is no standard metrics for quality uh, when it comes to synthetic data. So what we found was that field correlation stability and field distribution stability are common. They're, they're one of the more, two of the more popular stats used. And they're pretty basic to um, being um, needed if you're going to use a downstream statistical or machine learning task. But then we wanted something more than that. We wanted something that looked at the deep structure and multi-field um, multi-field correlations and distributions. And uh, while PCA isn't commonly used, we explored it and found it to be super useful. Um, it just is the the graph and the score is just a, a nice quick visual of um, if I were to use the synthetic data um, in a downstream task, is it going to work for me or not? Um, because it is what most people do when they start a machine learning task. They'll, they'll visualize the data with PCA. Sometimes they'll reduce the dimensions with PCA. So if we're not holding on to that um, PCA in the synthetic data, then you know you're going to have trouble. So that's how we came up with the three. And we're always open to new metrics. we will uh, always constantly researching, seeing what might be a nice addition to add to the report. Um, but these three covered the basic bases for us. And so that's what we're, we started with. Yeah, it's worth adding that there are a lot of metrics that are really specific to the downstream task. So, you know, if your task is purely statistical, like you only care about correlations, you might want to focus on that and have um, maybe a little bit more rigor in comparing correlations, um, or maybe you're interested in a specific pairwise correlation um, or something like that. And so like, those are very specific metrics, um, things like, you know, specific machine learning models. If you're looking at time series data, maybe you're, you know, interested in an ARIMA model or something like that. And, and those are very specific. And so what we have here is something that applies to a wide variety of data sets and um, sort of a wide variety of types that you find in tabular data. Right, awesome. wide variety of end use cases. Fantastic. So uh, another random question that I have, these are Mason's questions. I get to ask questions. Um, so like the, I'm looking at just this, this synthetic quality score and the, they're all relatively close to each other, 88, 90, 93. Are there cases where maybe your field correlation score is in the nineties, but your deep structure stability is like 20? Like what would, what would cause, are, are, are these scores relatively dependent on each other? Or are they completely independent? And what could it be possible for like them to be very heavily skewed across, uh, across the three independent scores? Um, they can be skewed. Um, that I've seen that happen many times, um, depending on uh, whether the config you chose to run maybe wasn't the, the best for this data set. But there is some dependence between the three. So um, Lipica, when Lipica shows us the formula for how we combine these scores into one overall school score, you'll note that we do weight them a little differently because they do um, overlap a little bit with what they're telling us about the quality of the data. Okay, fantastic. That sounds like it's a perfect segue to get into that part of the presentation. So, uh, Lipica, you'll I guess you'll show us the 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 formula. It sounds sounds so mysterious, even though it's not. It's on our blog. It's easy to find. Uh, let me add your screen there, and here we go. All right. So, what I've pulled up is 
that is a little formula that one of our colleagues, Andrew, wrote up in a blog that he published on uh, something that uses synthetic quality score, but um, is cooler and slightly different subject matter. So, so go check that out if you're interested um, in, in sort of sampling methods. But for now, we're going to focus on the SQS formula. So Amy talked through right, the three different components of SQS. There's um, deep structure stability, which is the PCA component. There's um, distribution stability um, and correlations. And basically what we do is each of these different components have sort of raw scores associated with them. So Amy talked about using like a Jensen Shannon divergence to calculate, for example, like the score relation raw score. And so that's on one scale. The PCA score is on a different scale. The distribution score is on a different scale. So we have a ton of raw scores and what we do is for each of these individual scores, so you can see this, this left-hand side here, we fit second order polynomials. And we do that using a collection of data sets um, that we've curated. Um, so a large number of data sets and we find the right or sort of the, the most adequate um, coefficients for these. So these alphas and betas and deltas. Then once we have scores, so each of these are on a zero to 100 scale or zero to one scale, um, effectively the same thing. We take those and we combine them into the SQS score. So again, like Amy said, this is like a weighted average of the different scores because yes, there are relationships between, you know, what the PCA score is, the distribution and the correlation. Um, and so we combine that all into one score that is that goes from zero to 100 um, and, and it's pretty consistent. Um, so if you had, you know, two totally different use cases, um, or two totally different data sets, and you landed up with similar PCA distribution and correlation scores, you'd end up with a similar synthetic quality score. Um, and that's kind of awesome because you get to compare right across different use cases, across different data sets. Um, you can compare SQS and learn something about those data sets. Cool. Fantastic. The formula scares me. <laughs> Anytime I see Greek letters in a mathematical formula, I immediately get terrified and I run away as fast as I can. <laughs> it's just polynomials. Just polynomials. I, I, bad words. All bad, bad words. I, I'm getting weird flashbacks to like gamma distribution and like advanced probability and stuff. Like it's <laughs> like it's I, I remember taking that in college and I was like, oh, it, it was so cool because the, the math you can do with probability is so cool. Like. It, it's stuff I was interested in, but then I had to do the math and I was like, oh no, <laughs> I don't want to do this. <laughs> so yeah, that's, that's, that's pretty good. Um, okay. So we have, well, there's one other question that I was going to uh, just ask, and this is more of an open-ended question. So we have this synthetic quality score. How, um, if, if, if you're a user who just generated their first, um, their first set of synthetic data and now they're looking at this synthetic quality score, how should they interpret that score? Like what are, what are, what is the use case like what are some of the use cases behind it or how can the your beginner user get get the most out of your synthetic quality score like from the f time of like first execution well i would say um uh going back to when i showed you at the top of the um the synthetic quality report if you do that drop down we list a whole bunch of use cases whether it's um, machine learning or pre-production testing and um, you should see whether um, your score um, is mapped to that use case. And if it is, then you're golden. So remember that um, when you're doing like um, data augmentation for a, a statistical or, or more usually machine learning, or you're doing some other data science or machine learning analysis on your data, you really need to have an excellent or a good score. You really need to um, have maintained those important statistical characteristics in the synthetic data. But other use cases, so pre-production testing, demoing, uh, things like that, um, it's not so critical that the statistical integrity was maintained. So you could have excellent, good, or even moderate would be just fine. And so, if you're getting uh, poor or very poor, that's when we point you to our tips on how you might want to improve uh, your sense report. 
So that's what you should first do is look at your score and see if it maps to your particular use case. Awesome. Yeah, I was literally just trying to pull that up. Thank you, Lipica. Um, great. Uh, let me look and see if we have any other, I don't have any questions in chat yet. So um, I have something in my notes here. I don't know exactly what it means. <laughs> Sometimes I should take better notes for myself. Um, it says just so distinguishing between high fidelity versus low fidelity data. Is that something that the quality score can help with or... Does that even make any sense or did I make a weird note? Now I don't even. <laughs> yeah, I think certainly. Um, so, I mean, fidelity is right. How well are these distributions mapped? I guess maybe to take a step back even, right? Like what, what we try to do with synthetic data, at least our synthetic data models at Gretel is to learn sort of the underlying distribution of the data set that you're trying to create a synthetic version of. And so if you compare or if you are able to well understand and or if the model is able to well understand and well recreate sort of what that distribution is um, and you generate synthetic data from such a model, you chances are you'd have a high fidelity data set. There's a lot of stuff that we do to ensure that also, you know, in addition to just using the model and relying on the model. But ideally, if you have you know, for example, isn't that data quality score of a 90, I would feel quite comfortable going and trying that out on whatever my downstream task is. So this is the, um, and maybe it's not the specific example, but somewhere uh, along the way we looked at, right, the, the US adult income data set from uh, UCI. And there the goal is to predict whether an individual's income is over 50K or under 50K. And so there I might take my synthetic data set and say, okay, let me, let me try with my synthetic data set instead. Um, and I would have reasonably high confidence that any classifier that I trained on the original data set, um, whatever the quality was there, um, I may well be able to maintain that quality or performance um, of my classifier with the synthetic set. I may also choose to augment that data set with my synthetic set. So, so it really depends, but with a score of a 90, like we see here, like we saw in Amy's example, um, I feel quite confident doing that. Now, on the other hand, if I had a score of maybe 60 or even 50, and I was simply looking to augment my training data with some examples from the minority class um, in that data set, I think, there is a slight class imbalance and there are fewer examples of folks with a higher income. And so I might choose, even if I did have poor synthetic quality, to take some samples from the minority class from my synthetic data and augment my training set. So it really obviously depends on the use case. Um, fidelity, of course, matters to different degrees depending on your use case. But for something like that, um, I would, you know, I'd go forth and try even with a synthetic quality score of 60. Interesting. The, and, oh, go ahead, Amy. And, and in fact, we did write a blog where um, we took a set, um, maybe 10 or so very popular Kaggle data sets, and one among them was this U.S. Adult Census income data set. And we, um, that each of these data sets had prediction tasks to them. And we ran them through um, a whole suite of different types of classification models and found that um, we do as well on the synthetic data as we do on the training data. Awesome. OK, so that, that makes you actually now I have another question that I so that I have. Uh, so you said 90, 90 is a good number. So like, I guess, excellent. So like, should be people be focusing on excellent? Because you know, there, there are some people out there who are going to be perfectionists, and they're going to be like, I need to have a 100% quality score, or I need to have a 99. Like, is there any value, say we had that synthetic data score of 90? Is there any value in really trying to like, chase theoretical perfect? Like, if I have 90, should I try to achieve 95 or 96? Or is or do you feel like that might almost be more effort than it's worth. I think it's more effort than it's worth. I, I, I think you can see in this particular blog that we brought up that the um, SQS scores uh, were not all 90. They ranged from 70 to 90 or something like that. And um, 
we still maintained the the same um, F1 or accuracy score in the prediction task with the synthetic data as we did with the train. So um, I think um, if you've got a score of 80 up um, or even 60 up, you go ahead and try your downstream task. You're, you're probably fine. Okay. So I guess that kind of leads into one of the questions that we had earlier, which was, does poor quality always mean poor performance on downstream tasks? Which maybe maybe if you said, if like, even if 60, I mean, some people would probably perceive 60 as bad, where we're all trained, you know, by the academic system that 60 is a bad number. So... Uh, but yeah, so does poor quality always mean a poor performance? My experience has been no. Um, often I'll use synthetic sense to augment my original training data. Um, and then often I'll use synthetic sets standalone. And usually in the first case, I'm happy to even use synthetic data that came from a model that had a quality score of 60 or 50. Uh, I'm happy to do that because, you know, it sort of cuts the additional time that it takes to generate more synthetic data or do a better model or, you know, all that hassle. Um, I can just kind of get to the point pretty quickly. Um, but I guess one thing to mention also uh, sort of thinking about your last question was, you know, if, if we're going to keep trying to improve our quality score and let's say like, you know, the perfectionists and you and me and Amy was like, we want a quality score of 100. Well, you know, a really simple way of getting a quality score of 100, right? It's to memorize your training data. And that completely defeats the point of using synthetic data and using a synthetic data model. So like chasing perfection might mean actually chasing memorization or chasing um, something that like compromises the privacy that we're hoping to gain by using synthetic data. Um, so not always a worthwhile goal to chase 100, um, but 90 certainly i mean i'm super happy with 90. i was yeah. gonna ask that yeah i was gonna ask if 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 you get closer to 100 does that potentially lead to like it's almost just the original data again like and it could lead to people being able to perform some sort of like identification attacks on it or something we never ever see a score of 100. <laughs> oh that's good to know that's awesome i've never like okay I, I what is the highest score you think you've ever seen oh 96, 98. Yeah, I think I've seen 98. It's important, it's important to note that um, the, our one, 1 to 100 scale for SQS is different than the educational grading system. So, for example, 80 to 100, we consider an A, excellent, versus, you know, academically, it would be 90 to 100. And then 60 to 80, we would consider a B, good. And so um, it's a little bit different than the normal grading system. I wish you would have graded at my school, Amy. Like <laughs> I, I would have been a straight A student the whole time. Like, <laughs> Oh my goodness. Well, that's, that's good to know. I know, I know that like we, it's, we've never explicitly said it's like the academic system, but people, when they see a scale of a hundred, they just get this like flashback of school and stuff. So that's, that's fantastic. Terrific. Um, cool. So another question we have here, um, is there any interesting research happening with regards to synthetic quality? I know y'all said y'all do a lot of research when y'all were uh, determining how to do all of this, but is there anything interesting happening right now or any just fun things that have got y'all excited about maybe the next steps of synthetic quality in general or here at Gretel? There is so much fun stuff out there. I mean, the great thing about the research community is that some um, one or the other is always publishing about important things. And as synthetic data gains traction, we have more folks thinking about synthetic quality. Now, there's a lot in specific fields. So like good quality medical data looks really different from good quality like um, sensor data from autonomous vehicles. So you might find different research groups doing different like you know, sort of strains of research um, on synthetic quality. But there's some there's some fun ones. Um, one that our team has been talking about a little bit is um, this paper that I have pulled up. It's called How Faithful Is Your Synthetic Data? Um, some really, really fun results where you know, they talk about um, how we can look at um, fidelity, diversity, and generalization 
um, of synthetic data and um, sort of how that compares to the training data, the original data, and how that might determine, you know, good quality versus bad quality. Um, and they do this with a lot of cool math, um, a lot of topology. Um, and basically the idea is for each synthetic sample, can you determine if it's a good sample versus, you know, how we've been thinking about this, which is for a given synthetic data set, comparing that to the training set, how good is that synthetic set? So that's a, a really exciting research paper that's that's pretty recently updated. Um, there's also another one that's been out for a while. Um, it's called General and Specific Utility Measures for Synthetic Data. And here they talk a lot about um, um, PMSC, so really like comparing mean square error between um, like synthetic set and original training set. Um, I think this is a lot more sort of in line with um, uh, the interests of the Royal Statistical Society. <laughs> um, so other statisticians out there who are using um, synthetic data for, for really like statistical models and the inference, um, I think a lot of the things in here um, make a lot of sense you know, using propensity scores or propensity mean square arrow um, as a metric and building metrics off that. So there's a, a lot of fun stuff happening. There has been a lot of research over the last few years, um, but certainly things that we're excited about. Um, and, and really, when we look at a new research paper, a lot of what we think is, hey, can we, can we use this? But also in the framework of this research paper, like where do we land? Um, are we sort of meeting the criteria? Where do we fall short? Um, is there something you know, beyond just like for the specific, specific research paper, if we were to use it um, in Gretel Evaluate or in our synthetic quality report, would it apply broadly to sort of the data sets that we see, um, which obviously covers a lot of different industries, lots of different shapes and sizes and types of data. So there's uh, a little bit more like critical thinking and then sort of like application to the things that we see our users um, wanting. Um, and that's the fun of it too. Couldn't find the mute button there for a second. Awesome. Well, I think that leads us with our last question, which I will share my screen here for. Um, and the last question is, can I use Gretel Evaluate with synthetic data that's not generated with Gretel? So the answer to that is absolutely. You can enter any two data sets you want, right? In the demo I did, I did a um, synthetic data created by Gretel, but you could um, have it created by anyone to um, see how your particular um, model did. Or, um, so, yeah, it's open to any two data sets. Fantastic. And I've dropped the link in the chat, but um, this blog is the blog that is announcing Gretel Evaluate. So if you're looking for the notebook that Amy demoed, it's right here in the blog. You can just come here and immediately uh, grab it and run your own Gretel Evaluate. Um, I'm One thing I'm always really happy about with Gretel is I think our SDKs are really simple, um, straightforward SDKs to use. So I think it'll be really, I don't think you'll have too much of a difficult time and you can start playing around generating your own, uh, well, using Gretel to generate synthetic data and then measuring it or bringing in your own data and seeing, uh, you know, what the chance is. Now, okay, so I have a random question and this could be completely not even like useless or not true, but like, what if you, could, could you use this to, gen like say you had two data sets that were like similar, they were not synthetic copies of each other. What happens if you were to run that through Gretel Evaluate? Like would, would these, I mean, it probably wouldn't get a really great score, but I don't know. I, this is me just spitballing right now. I'm making it up. But like I had two data sets that I look at. These are same fields, very similar quality. Is there any value of evaluating two non-synthetic data sets together against each other using this metric? Or is that just Mason making up stuff? Yeah, I could see that. If you took a sample of the training data, um, um, one sample, and then you took a, a separate sample and you create, and you wanted to see whether my two samples um, were statistically equivalent to each other, then you could run those two samples through Gretel Evaluate and make sure that the statistical integrity in both of them matches up. So you know that your sampling technique is appropriate. Okay. 
Oh, that's I didn't even think about that. So you could say you have a really large data set, and instead of generating synthetic data, you just sample, say, 10,000 columns out of a billion column data set. So yeah. you could then compare them and see if what the what like if it's representative. Oh, that's so cool. I never even thought of that. Yeah. And that's, another example that's got some value. I have another example I have is um you, know, you could use in theory, you could use Gretel Evaluate to examine distribution shift. So kind of similar to what Amy said. But you know, let's say you collected some data two years ago and you collected data every year since, you might want to see has the distribution of that data changed. So it could be something like you know, people's preferences or you know, your favorite survey um, that's done across many years. You might see if there's a change in the distribution um, in how people are responding and, um, you know, whatever you're trying to gauge through the survey. So that's another, uh, yeah, I think, any yeah, Gradle Evaluate. Oh, that's so cool. I love that. I'm going to, I'm going to try that now. I, I didn't even think about that. So. Awesome. Well, I think we're pretty much um, up with things to talk about this time. Do either of y'all have anything else you want to chat about? Um, just off the, off the top of your head, or, or are we good? I think I'm good. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Uh, it's been great having Amy and Lipica here. Um, I always get love getting to learn from really smart people, so I just got to sit back and watch and learn about, evaluate, and all these fun things. Um, so for any of you who are watching, um, oh, I have to pull something up. Give me one second. We have a, we have a little giveaway that we always do. Um, where'd it go? Okay, we're gonna make that a little bit bigger. Um, so if you are watching today, as always, we're gonna be doing our swag kind of giveaway. That's not what I wanted. Make it bigger. There we go. Bigger. Um, so if you would like and you've enjoyed this talk today and you want to learn more about synthetic data, you can either scan this QR code or go to the link that you see on your screen, grtl.ai slash evaluate dash deep dive. Um, you have a week to do this. So if you watch this after the fact, um, you have until August 10th, 2022 to go in, you know, give us your name. If you want some swag, give us your shipping information. We'll, we'll ship you um, some stickers. And then if you want to hear more about Gretel, um, you know, there's a little checkbox, yes or no, let us know if you want to hear more about it. And we'll reach out to you and uh, inform you know about this yet, or, or sorry, my brain just went into different words. We'll inform you more about Gretel and all the fun things. Um, if you want to catch more of our Gretel live streams and you're on YouTube or LinkedIn, be sure to follow us. If you're on YouTube, make sure to ring the little bell to get the notifications. We will be going live again, I think, twice more this month. Next week, I'll be back doing an introduction to synthetic data, so starting at the beginning. And then we have another deep dive we'll do later at the month, and I don't think we've determined the topic on that one yet. Um, but thank you everyone for tuning in. Thank you, Amy and Lipica so much for joining us. I'm looking forward to having you back in the future to learn a lot about a lot more cool stuff. Um, and if y'all have ever have any topics y'all want to talk about, please let me know and we'll, uh, we'll, we'll chat with them, but thank you so much. And thank you everyone. And we'll see you next time. Thanks Mason.